you had to be for this, go to him. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, that, that, that's, that's how it's going to work. What our friend from north of the border is trying to say. So that's how it's going to work. That's how it's going to work. Are you, are you wooging with the right hand first? Or are you yeah, woogle woogle woo. Woogle woogle woo. Yeah, I think I'm it's, with And on the woo and the wee, there's a little hip thing. Waka waka woo. Waka waka woo. Waka waka wee. But if we do a hip thing, we might not get a close up, right? I think it'd be very hip. Okay, waka waka woo. Waka waka woo. Waka wee, the other way, right? With the left first. I think that's Buffalo Lost Brothers' choice. Oh, it is really? Well, I say left, goddammit. I'm the leader. It's not waka waka woo. What's with the hip shake? Waka waka woo. I'm asking a question. Waka waka woo. 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 Wooga wooga wee! Wooga wooga wee! Picky picky picky! Pokey pokey pokey! Ah! That I got, but it's still it's still the waka waka. I can pretty much waka woo kiss that Gibson festival goodbye. I'm gonna do this. Right, waka waka woo. Ah, so you do wind up with one down? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then waka woo. And then it's wooga wooga wee. Wooga wooga wee. I can't work with this man. Waka, waka, woo. <laughs> wooga, wooga, wooga. Yeah, exactly. So you're just set to go. It. You don't have to. It's your set. You're set. You're, you're in, in wooga position after the waka. Yeah. Okay. okay. One last rehearsal. One last rehearsal. One last rehearsal. One last rehearsal. Lodge you brothers. You guys don't need so this. So swap is out. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. The last rehearsal. So oh, Fred, Fred, out how Fred pulls yeah. and he turns. Hooray! Waka, waka, woo! Waka, waka, woo! I had been hearing that the Amblin was uh, going to do a, a big screen version of the Flintstones. And, uh, you know, in those days I was a writer, producer, and television predominantly. And uh, by the time word would trickle down to me whenever they needed a new draft and the various attempts to launch this, uh, by the time the news got down to me, the assignment was gone. And in 1992, 1993, I think it was, uh, I had heard it again, and I called my agent. I said, you got to get me in to meet with them on the Flintstones. I'd love to do it. And he calls me back, and he says, well, someone's already writing the script. I go, uh oh. He said, but they're interested in meeting with you as a director. Ah. It was the combination of his directorial experience, his hilarious sense of humor, and the fact that he is Mr. Flintstone. I mean, he knows so much about that show, loved the characters, knew the characters, really wanted to stay true to the characters and to present a film that all Flintstone fans would recognize as, hey, they really nailed the Flintstones in a feature. So I went in and I met with Steven Spielberg and Kathy Kennedy uh, during lunchtime uh, uh, while they were shooting Jurassic Park and sat in Steven's office and uh, was for about 10 minutes about as bumbling a fool and talking like this as you could possibly be. And uh, when I finally uh, pulled myself together, I think I gave them a pretty good showing of someone who had spent uh, their career working in family comedy, who had a, uh, who understood the franchise, who Stephen was very impressed that I collect Flintstone toys. The minute I met him, I actually, the minute he took me to his house, and showed me his entire collection of Flintstone toys, products, and paraphernalia, which kind of overran the living room. There wasn't really a living room, it was more just like Flintstone stuff everywhere. I knew he was the right person for the job. As you can see, I'm sitting here with my entire Flintstones collection. Uh, and the Flintstones occupies an interesting place in my heart and in my life. 
and I thought that I should be the person to help translate that affection to the screen because what I am is a fan of the Flintstones. Once he surfaced, he was the perfect choice, and that's kind of how the idea came, to come, came together. So once they decided to do it, it all happened very quickly. I was hired to direct the film finally in, uh, in December, and, uh, and then it got to the point, as many films do, where uh, it was decided that there needed to be a big rewrite, and I volunteered my services along with uh, altogether about 20 of my uh, closer comedy writing brethren. And uh, we locked ourselves up in a room over at Amblin, and with uh, Mr. Spielberg popping in every few hours, uh, uh, we knocked off a new first draft using the sort of techniques that that uh, I had come to enjoy and what I feel are the best things about television, team writing, sitting around in an environment that promotes uh, uh, spontaneity. What the script really needed was funny gags, true Flintstonian touches, and a comedy punch-up. So he said, well, what I do on Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley and all the great sitcoms that he'd worked on is what you do on a, a sitcom, which is you get the 12 funniest people you can in a room and they all start pitching out jokes. And I was, as we uh, used to say, holding the pencil. And uh, basically everyone agrees where scene's going and the direction of it, and you're basically hammering out business and uh, and filling in the blanks uh, of dialogue to get you where you want to go in the structure of a scene within the story. I was in the room with the writers, and it was it was fun and hilarious. The writers loved doing it. They had never done it on a feature before. It's not the most perfect way to work, uh, but it is a method, and it was very successful in this. And that you had a lot of people whose experience was in family comedy and in doing what I would call living room comedy, which is what the Flintstones is. It's about the relationships between Fred and Wilma and Fred and Barney and between Wilma and Betty. And it, its origins are in the sitcom world. And thus, having people who are experienced in that milieu was an advantage. Doing a film of the Flintstones sort of created this whole sense of fun and energy and enthusiasm among everyone because it was the Flintstones. I mean, there's nothing, they're kind of the funnest people around and the wackiest world you could be in. We have not left the boundaries of the situation comedy. We have expanded them and turned the Flintstones into a sitcom on steroids. <laughs> shouldn't have. I didn't. This was all Barney and Betty's idea. Aren't we as lucky to have friends like them, Fred? The cast that we put together, uh, I can't believe how well they gelled, how well they worked together. It's really, the cast is more like a band. Uh, keep, keeping a tight beat and a steady rhythm is Rick Moranis as Barney. Uh, on strings, Elizabeth Perkins as Wilma. The brass section, Rosie O'Donnell as Betty. And playing lead guitar is John Goodman as Fred. And together they make beautiful comedic music together. Wilma, I'm home! We started with John Goodman. Um, Steven Spielberg had, it had come to him several years ago that the, if there was gonna be a Fred Flintstone on the big screen, it was John Goodman and only John Goodman. And so that had been uh, what Steven's first rule of the Flintstones from the beginning was, we're only gonna make this movie if we have John to be Fred. So that was where we started. We were doing a movie called Always, and Steven asked me, uh, he, no, he actually told me that I was gonna play Fred Flintstone for him. And instead of smacking the little bugger, I just kind of sat there and smiled. And it's, uh, I'm, be honest with you, I'm a little nervous about it, because I think I'm going to hear Yabba Dabba Doo for the rest of my life. Yabba Dabba Doo! Yabba Dabba Doo! Yabba Dabba Doo! The idea of taking a cartoon character and making him a real person, what John did was flesh him out was to make him real, was to make you believe him, was to make you love him, which is to make you want to forgive him, as you always did with Fred Flintstone. Fred is a large, two-dimensional, three-fingered man with a heart of gold and a bad haircut. <laughs> and I've had to sport this bad haircut for the last three months, and I'm about tired of it. 
there isn't a scene where he just doesn't throw in something coming right off the top of his head uh, every day. Just little pieces, expressions, looks, a line here and there, just creating, and he's so free, and it's such free association uh, in his process that he's so spontaneous and fun and bigger than life. Fred does have three fingers, and I was going to have him surgically removed and frozen and reattached later, but I, I thought that was a little much. Oh, Barn, I admire you. You've lost your job, your dignity, but not your sense of humor. <laughs> hey, Barn, you like your steak rare? That one's yours. Hey! Stop. Rick Moranis was a natural for Barney. I think when you mentioned Barney Rubble, people thought for two minutes and they came up with Rick Moranis. So he was the next person we approached and we were fortunate that he believed in the project and liked the script enough to say yes, absolutely. I would love to be, to be Barney to John Goodman's Fred. I first started hearing about this uh, many years ago before um, I think they really got serious about it. But uh, in the mid 80s, I had, I had started to hear talk about them doing this show and that they were interested in me doing it. And I said, sure, it sounds great to me, because I, I love this kind of stuff. I love um, family entertainment. Rick Moranis made you believe in Barney Rebel's vulnerability. He made you believe that Barney's an intelligent man who, who, who is gracious to a fault, who is giving, who is caring, and, and who is possibly not a strong enough person to control their destiny. Hey, watch it, will you? Finally got my hair the way I like it. I'm just so excited, Fred. I'm gonna be a father. <laughs> it's like a dream come true. A son. Someone to carry on the proud name of Rubble. You gonna be a good daddy, Fred? Well, you're bound to find something you're good at. Yeah, sure. <laughs> hey! <laughs> Since we had two big movie stars who have been in wonderful, successful films and are very well loved by the American public, we felt that gave us some freedom to, rather than being stuck with casting names, that we could really look at everyone who was out there and find the two women who came into the audition and, through their performance, announced, I am Wilma Flintstone, I am Betty Rubble. And one at a time, that happened. When Elizabeth Perkins opened her mouth to audition, we knew that we had found Wilma. In terms of, of, of taking it out of the animated version and bringing it into the live action version, I mean, basically, you're taking two-dimensional characters and trying to make them into three-dimensional characters. And so, as much as you can get all the look down and get the walk and the hair and the voice and the makeup, um, it has to be really grounded in some kind of reality or else it is just an impersonation. When Elizabeth Perkins came in and read, uh, she walked out of the room and we looked at each other and said, that's Wilma. <laughs> uh, because she was the first person who came in and turned a cartoon character into a real person without sacrificing the humor uh, and making her believable and uh, vulnerable and strong. Isn't this nice, Betty? The Flintstones and the Rubbles, all under one roof. Yes, but Wilma, this is such an imposition. Are you sure it's okay with Fred? Oh, absolutely. As a matter of fact, he thinks it was his idea. <laughs> Rosie is not the physical embodiment of Betty Rubble, but Rosie, Rosie has Betty's personality within her. And when she smiles, when she laughs, uh, she makes she brings Betty alive and makes her all her own. To put it simply, Rosie O'Donnell is the funniest person I've ever met. It's my big scene, Betty Rubble. This is called Betty Rubble and the Flintstones. Ready? And we're shooting. I gotta love to talk. Real busy. Boston 866. That means the movie's starting. Thanks for coming. Parker. Love you. Ready? And action. The amazing thing about Rosie was the first time we met her, I discovered she knew more about the Flintstones than I did. This is someone whose knowledge of the series was encyclopedic. And, and knowing the series so well, she could have played anybody. <laughs> Wilma, Fred, <laughs> Dino, she knows everybody inside out. But the, where she fit best for us was his Betty. Only the laugh, the Betty Rubble laugh, I think, is very distinctive, and that's really the only aspect of Betty that's identifiable. And when they first told me Betty Rubble, the first thing I thought of was, <laughs> which she did after every line with Wilma, you know. Oh, Barney doesn't like that. <laughs> so when I went for the audition, after every line, I did the Betty Rubble laugh, and... Uh, that's the thing that I think clenched it for me. So we thought we really had a good thing going casting-wise once we had John Goodman and Elizabeth Perkins and Rick Moranis and Rosie O'Donnell and Kyle McLaughlin and Halle Berry. These were really, this was gonna be a really strong cast. So we had this role 
for Pearl Slaghubel, Fred's mother-in-law, Elizabeth's mother, and we started thinking that we wanted to get someone really spectacular, that it was sort of a drop-dead chance for a cameo. I, I've learned a few things, you know, trying out for films as a director, and one of the things I ask you is, so who do you see in these roles? And when they came to Pearl Slaghubel's, Wilma's mother, I've learned that you say the biggest name you can think of, <laughs> and I said, Elizabeth Taylor, and what do you know? <laughs> She's a Flintstone fan, and it's great because she wanted to be in this film. It's great fun. As an actress, um, I've been prepared to do anything uh, in my career, and ending up being in a cartoon doesn't seem unseemly at all. It seems very fitting. Elizabeth Taylor, who was a great sport, if nothing else, uh, and she seemed like she had a lot of fun on the picture but when she the first day she showed up she had a little dog sugar with her and i walked up and looked at it and said lunch and she laughed so i i, I figure it was either i'd take a shot and uh she was great and she was so much fun to work with look drunk as a skunkosaurus one of the disadvantages of doing a barefoot movie is that you're frequently walking around a set without 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 your shoes and uh, I was wearing mine and uh, we had an unfortunate collision <laughs> and what she did so she said everything's fine everything's fine and we did the shot and she went off stage and when she returned she was limping horribly her foot was bandaged up and I go oh I'm so sorry I I can't believe that I did this I'm so embarrassed and meanwhile I hear people laughing behind me he was winking to the crew ha <laughs> ha putting him on and I think that was very nice of her and she's been terrific and funny and unique. It's as much fun on the set as I thought it would be. Everybody is so nice and it's a wonderful crew and the cast are all just great. Oh, there he is! There's my big handsome son-in-law. Oh. Have you lost weight? Have we met? With every step of this production the question has become how do you take that which is a two-dimensional animated drawing and make it real make it tangible make it rock make it stone make it petrified wood to create an entirely new universe but one that is totally familiar to fans of the flintstones the extraordinary challenge, but fun, of doing a Flintstones movie from a production standpoint is that every single item that appears on the screen has to be made. Every costume, every prop, every piece of set decorating. You can't get to the set that day and say, oh, we need more of these, and send out to the store to get them, because everything had to be manufactured to look like it really came from bedrock. Look at the show was a question early on, uh, how much do we make it look like the cartoon? How much do we pay homage to that? Or, or do we take it into real people uh, kind of a look? And uh, the art direction is somewhere kind of in between. I mean, it's all dimensional, it's all carved, but it's painted to look like, uh, you know, synthetic uh, rocks. It's painted to look like the cartoon that we know. I was attracted to this script because every element in the picture was a, uh, had to sort of be generated uh, or uh, through an art department. It was extremely frightening to read the script and realize that we would have to completely make every single object. One of the things that is fabulous about working with Spielberg's productions is that he puts together a wonderful art department and there's illustrators and fabulous artists working from a very early phase. When you learn to speak the Flintstonian language, how do you translate uh, what we know how to build things out of millions of different materials, uh, but in the Flintstone language, you're limited. You have stone, bone, shell, and skin. And that's it. Now, how do you take those natural shapes, those colors, and translate them into the things that you know? Everything has been uh, designed uh, and carved and painted as rock or bone or leather. He used to bring stacks every day of drawings, the output of my department, run them by Bill, run them by Brian, uh, have all those kinds of collaborations and conversations that go on, revise. All the drawings, thousands of them, would come through me and uh, we'd talk about them and hone them and make sure that everything was from the right era and, and then go out and build them. Brian gave us great latitude 
to in all departments the props department the decorating department for the sets uh, you know certainly you know scrutinizing everything we did but it was uh, he gave us uh, a lot of latitude to sort of submit any sort of interesting gag we had and if he felt it could work work into the story uh, he was happy with that which is always you know thrilling to any art department on any movie let alone this Flintstones but he knew that there was it was a picture loaded with visual if, if, they, if it wasn't a gag, it was a visual background. There used to be a store when I was growing up and they'd advertise, from carpet on the floor to pictures on the wall, everything you need. And we had to create every item that you see in every house. We created the entire downtown city of Bedrock. We created a world populated with strange prehistoric animals and people <laughs> and, and tried to make it seem real. The, the, the things you were seeing that, that filled every inch of the frame, that this was part of everyday life in bedrock, and that was the real test. So, so the, not as to focus on every lobster lawnmower and funny title on a book, but just to have it there and be part of everyday life in bedrock. With every thing that we do, you want to make it a little bit bigger than life. Everything we have here, the scale of the furniture, if you look around, and I watch that very close so that I can get in, in the mood or, or learn the feel of the film from the director and the direction that he's going. So when I show him something, and I always show him ahead of time, we try to, to fit that mood that's, you know, the manner it's being directed. I think I had about uh, three months to prepare. Um, and the first month was certainly taken up with those kinds of realizations and uh, finding the proper people to build with for me, draw for me, um, and organize with me. And it was really just trying to figure out all together with construction and the art department the best construction techniques and ways of getting it going. We did a lot of experimenting, um, research into different kinds of uh, textures and colors. You hope that they really feel that they're in this environment and that these things really exist. You don't want uh, their eyes to be looking at this kind of stuff and saying, gee, where's the cable, where's the battery, where's this? You, you try to make it so that it's uh, an everyday part of normal life in the environment you're dealing with. So uh, we've done our best to not upstage the actors with them or not uh, just uh, overdo them, but just make them look like they belong. We wanted some key beats, birds that were record players, um, the cars, the scrub brushes, the, the, uh, the, the mammoth with his trunk that you use to wash your hands with, and there were a few classic key Flintstonian type things, beats that we had to hit. The, the detail is amazing on, on uh, like I have a little shaver that's a, a little animal that gnaws at my face and it, it, you know it's got all the uh, great record players or is a bird's head and it's just it's amazing how detailed this thing is and how um, how much work went into it. They must have been doing this for years. I, I really don't know uh, how long they've been working at it. We've had wonderful sculptors carving non-stop 20, 30 sculptors carving foam uh, for five months, six months. So it was quite a long prep time. Amblin knew they had a, a tiger by the tail. They knew it needed a lot of prep time. Uh, the budgets were adjusted accordingly, knowing that we could never go out and purchase anything. Everything had to be drawn, scrutinized, budgeted, eventually built, carved, foamed, carved, painted, and the paper trail is horrendous. Is just a huge undertaking. And when you look and see that, uh, you know, even after the film was done, the, the size of a, a 250,000 foot warehouse jammed from top to bottom with everything that we created for the film, uh, you, you really see, you know, what it took. cars wanted to be recognizable from the Flintstones, so Brian kept bringing his toys in. He has quite an extensive toy collection. The first one we decided to start with was Fred's, the four-seater, uh, wood-sided uh, with a canopy on it. And we really worked from the toy. The things that people ask about all the time when you say to them, we're doing Flintstones as a movie, they want to know, one, 
do people drive their cars with their feet? That's by far the biggest. A lot of people have asked, do the backgrounds repeat behind the characters like they do in the show when they're two people driving a car and the same tree passes by 30 times? Which actually we don't really do because in our world they're going down a real road. A lot of people have asked about the cars and uh, I, I too, when I first heard that they were going to do this, was wondering if they were going to do the cars. And when we came to the set and... Uh, and saw them it was it was just funny to see them recreated in three dimensions and um, I don't know if it's better to spoil the secret of how they work or, or whether to try and convince people that we're actually driving them with our feet we have probably uh, close to two dozen vehicles nine of them have motors and run Another six of them have steering and brakes so that we can tow them. We really build real Flintstone cars, the car they really drive, they steer. We have a wonderful effects department, Michael Lantieri's effects department, that have done wonders with these cars and um, people really drive them and they really use their feet when they need to, <laughs> so it's very interesting that way. I went forward with the throttle also. I need to actually be doing this now after talking, after watching the Flintstones for 25 years, I actually be doing this. Is... <laughs> Brian, we're ready to set number That's one. Strange. We wanted to go about 20 miles an hour at our top speed, and uh, we'd have to hide brakes, we'd have to hide uh, throttle so that their feet weren't touching any pedals. So each car is equipped with a brake and a throttle on pedals and as well on hand buttons. So when you see their feet running on the ground or jamming down to a stop, that's ground that we've prepared, so we know they're not gonna pick up a nail or something like that. As well as the car has uh, hand throttles so that they could keep their feet clean and clear, and that's the way we uh, worked around it. The scouting process for Flintstones was the simplest <laughs> ever. We visited uh, the quarry. We said, great, we'll build here. And we visited Vasquez Rocks, which I had seen, everyone's seen hundreds of times in movies, TV shows, but you didn't know what it was because people use it very differently from different views, and it's a very ecologically sensitive area, so naturally we built a movie set in it, but we were very fortunate that we built Fred's neighborhood uh, in the overflow parking lot, so we weren't bothering any uh, ecologically sensitive areas, and the idea was to take a suburban neighborhood and populated with, uh, with houses and families and people mowing their lawns and tending their gardens and washing their cars. And once again, just a slice of Americana, B.C. We built this wonderful suburban uh, village, but the fun of it was we had to keep the main road open because it was still an, an open park during the day and on the weekends. So you, we would have real people driving through this Flintstone thing and people would just, their eyeballs would bug out. What is this? As it started to become more complete, we started getting word during the weekends that thousands of people were coming to see the sets and, and you'd walk onto the street and you felt like you were in bedrock. We started with drawings and then into smaller models and models of the entire street and then figuring out how we were going to carve foam in combination with plastering and cement to bring this all to life and it was a huge job and we we're very fortunate to uh, to think ahead to say hey we should document that and we did a camera that took like a frame every couple hours or so and so you can see the hundreds of people swarming all over this area and watching it grow and come together and once again when you came over the hill and entered that street you were in another time but it was familiar and warm and you knew exactly where you were I brought guests out to see the uh, to see the bedrock set out, out here in the quarry, and, and they're all flabbergasted because it, it looks like a cartoon brought to life. Every uh, location on this movie was something unlike anything I had ever seen before, and um, is completely from another time and another place, and is so recreated from the cartoon down to like the tree that stands in the Flintstone yard is exactly from the cartoon and, and the drive-in movie theater. I mean, down to the most minute details. Things that pr probably people wouldn't, wouldn't even see on camera, um, you know, were designed. Where they've spared no uh, detail in recreating bedrock as, as it was. And it's, it's really phenomenal to see what they've done with, uh, you know, the rocks. 
I definitely believe I'm in bedrock. I mean, definitely, with all the, you know, the, the, the sets. In the reading and in the auditions, it's kind of hard because you don't have the things, but once you get on the set and you have all the props and the largeness of it all and everybody's in their costume, you really do feel like, you know, you've been transformed into, you know, bedrock. The first time that we lit up downtown bedrock, we just a photograph it, see how it looked. We brought in the giant moose go lights and everything, and it wasn't real. <laughs> it, was, it was like the same kind of feeling that when you were little and you opened up a, a book of fairy tales and you saw the castles glimmering in the distance, uh, there was something magical about it. You knew. You, everyone in America has seen that cartoon, and you turned the corner of Vasquez Rocks, and you knew where you were. You were in bedrock. There was no doubt. And so that was very exciting to us, and we saw how excited people were about being in bedrock, and we thought then, you know, we may really be onto something. After months uh, of working on the design of the film, uh, we had a visit from the creators, uh, Bill Hanna and Joe Barbera and we took them around. I, I drove them in Barney's car, and uh, we took them to Fred's house. We showed them the hundreds of props that were being manufactured, uh, the warehouse where the set dressing was being stored. We showed them the plans for the downtown and the photographs of the quarry and, and the models of all the Henson creatures. And, uh, and at the end of it, Bill Hanna uh, took me by the arm, and he looked me in the eyes, and he said, Never in my wildest dreams did I ever expect to see anything like this. And that's when I knew that we'd hit bedrock. For the first time, I was working with large-scale visual effects, special effects, uh, enormous amount of puppetry of the things, the elements out of which movie magic is created. And I was very fortunate to be surrounded by the very best people uh, behind the camera and uh, way behind the camera. And, and, and the team that we put together of, of our director of photography, Dean Cundy, who's done such landmark visual effects films like the Back to the Future films and Jurassic Park, and put them together with uh, the, the dinosaur design team and the computer graphics team at ILM and the wizards at the Henson Creature Shop in London and throw in the group from Hanna-Barbera and I look like a master chef with all these great ingredients just mixing them together and letting them do what they do best and trying to be the guide, hacking, <laughs> hacking our way through here, trying to make a semblance of this and to get all these people to look and feel the same way about things. We wanted the elements of whimsy and of fantasy and of magic that the cartoon has, but we didn't want anything to feel animated at all. It was very important to us that all of our creatures felt like they were live and performing as people with the actors. Because in the Flintstone world, too, the animals all have human characteristics. Many of them speak, and they're sort of a part of the Flintstone family. That's how we, we from the very first, thought of the Hensons, because they are the industry leaders and the best at creating actual characters that you can have with you live on the set performing, as opposed to using computer generation and putting them in later. The uh, Henson Creature Shop I think in all built 23 creatures, uh, ranging in size from the old rodent razor that Fred shaves with, who bites him, uh, to the Bronto crane, uh, the neck of which alone was 23 feet long, which, uh, which uh, moved on literally railroad tracks and took uh, about 20 people to operate and to move it from place to place. You needed two cranes. The one area where we, we went away from that is with Dino, because Dino, as he's designed as the original character, can't really be a man in a suit or a real creature, because his front legs are very short, he has this long body, and there's really no way to recreate him other than from scratch and have him be his own individual. So we went to 
Industrial Light and Magic, and we said, work the magic again that you created for Jurassic Park, which was you were able to make creatures that aren't really existing in our world and make them look like they're real on the screen. In all, uh, ILM did, I believe, there's only like 63 CG shots in the film, but I don't think people appreciate how difficult most of them were that when, you know, Dino is uh, licking Fred's face and jumping from side to side, you start with an actor going, no, no, Dino, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. And now you got to put Dino in <laughs> so that every time that John Goodman goes like that, having been licked, he needs to be licked. And I wouldn't want to do that backwards. <laughs> I think that's a very difficult job. And they did things like removing puppeteers. Uh, when the dick the bird flies, there's a man holding a rod that controls the bird and is, uh, you know, a cable operated to make the wings flap, and he's running alongside behind the bird, and he had to be removed. Who knows how they do these things? And there's great detail that people don't notice. When, when the brontosaurus pulls a rock from the side of the quarry wall, the dust and the other rocks that come spilling down, you really don't notice them, but they're there, and there's those kind of details that, that make it so perfect there so that you believe it. Fred, do you have to get Dino so wound up when you come home? Not my fault. Maybe he'd calm down if we had him fixed. What? <laughs> Every day coming to work was, was nerve-wracking. This is a big movie, <laughs> and, and there's so much at stake that it was very hard uh, to just be loosey-goosey and have as much fun as I would love to have because I have an, a great job here in having the reins to a property uh, that I always loved, that I loved the imagination and the imagery and the characters, and bringing it to life is an arduous, difficult task, but one which I accepted and, and worked very hard to, how do you say it, to bring the Flintstones alive. Just the, the, the bedrockian Flintstone-ness of it all just made for a great time. Everyone really had a lot of fun doing the movie and a lot of fun trying to bring this world to life. I've never, you can never, it only happens once or twice in a career, I suppose, a movie like this that's so heavily, uh, uh, a movie that's so heavily involved with their art department, which is, uh, you know, always fun for us. If you can rise to the occasion, I think we all did in the art department. I think the audience really responded well to the visuals on the in the picture. Um, there was a lot of praise that we got. People stopped me all the time and told me how much they enjoyed watching the Flintstones. It was really fun to see. It was rich. It was interesting. It was funny. Well, it sounded like uh, such fun. It was. It's a giggle to do, and. Uh, I and my kids have always loved the Flintstones. I definitely was a fan of, the, fan of the Flintstones growing up. I think every kid on my block was a fan of the Flintstones, you know. I think um, I like Fred the best, um, but I also like the costumes and sort of the bizarreness of it all. It was fun to like escape into that world even as a child. I was a fan of the show to the point where my Cub Scout meeting was on, started I believe at 8 o'clock on Friday nights and uh, I, I'd always have to miss one Flintstones a month. Uh, gee, I guess that's when it started, way back in 1960, and I really hated that a lot. And I've grown up twisted and became an actor. I remember when the show came on, it debuted in prime time in the early 60s. You can ask Brian Levan, he knows everything about the show. Everything that was ever known about the show is known by the director of this picture. Um, I can't remember, I just remember I was a little kid and somebody came over to the house to pick up a cousin of mine. It was her first date and it was the night that the Flintstones came on, so we all watched it. And uh, from then on, I, I guess I was, yeah, a fan of the show. It was, uh, it was fun. It was a, a great sitcom-ish thing. Uh, but my favorite part of the Flintstones was Gazoo, which is not a part of this uh, movie. Maybe in the sequel, who knows? There'll be a big Gazoo character, but I loved him because his magic powers, so that was always fun. I loved Anne Margrock, also not in this film. A lot of the things I loved aren't in the movie, come to think of it. <laughs> I love this movie. Uh, I couldn't be happier with it it was a, a a labor of love not just on my part on the part of the actors on the part of the entire production team the crew uh mark mangini our sound effects editor whose life is animation and who began his career at at, uh, at hanna-barbera 
Uh, I, I can't tell you how many people at the end of the film would come up and say, you know, this is the best professional experience I've ever had. And then to have that on top of watching families lining up four deep an hour before shows to get into theaters, I mean, that's not much more you can ask for as someone who aims to entertain. And, you know, we take people away from the 20th century and give them something to marvel at, something to laugh at, uh, and, and characters uh, that they really took to their heart. And uh, that's very rewarding. And uh, you have to cherish those moments because they're few and far between in any career. I'm so proud of you. And I'm proud of you, Barney. And I'm starving. Me too. What do you say we get some breakfast? Snake and eggs for everybody. My treat. Great. <laughs> Barney. Yes, yeah, great. Could you spare me a couple bucks? I'm a little short. Not this time, but... Oh, 